We had a surprise this week. We were, uh, it was in the evening, and we have two cats, as you know, Winston and Clementine. And normally they're pretty good on guard duty, but something, some of their discipline fell apart at some point recently. As um, one was asleep on the couch, and uh, we were watching a Sherlock Holmes episode of an old black and white Sherlock Holmes show. And Amanda's looking at Clementine had gotten up, and so she was walking around. And she stopped. And then Amanda was looking at her, and that was toward the basement door. And suddenly another little face appeared around the corner of the door. It was too small for a cat, but it was not too small for a large chipmunk. We had an invader, <laughs> which Clementine promptly pounced on. So sometimes cats are worth their weight in cat food. Now we're, now we're a little bit paranoid, you know. We go around and we're checking, are there any, where, how did that thing get in here? You know, we, we checked all around the basement, all around the foundation. You've you got to keep them away from your foundation. They'll tunnel down and actually can cause basement, or, uh, ba basement foundations to collapse in particular. We had neighbors near Columbus who uh, had that problem. But just a, a little adventure. It's always nice to have something happen that's interesting, and that, that, that was definitely interesting. Well, we want to, uh, want to address something that is timely with the, uh, the events of this particular month on the, on the Roman calendar, or the, technically the Gregorian calendar. It's not a Roman calendar anymore, although it was the uh, Pope Gregory, one of the Pope Gregories, I forget what number went after his name, is the one for whom the calendar that we use on a daily basis is named. And that's, of course, the Christmas. Christmas season has arrived. You've noticed, we've all noticed, music changes, and you get this repetition on playlist on most stations, and not very many that we can enjoy listening to, so the radio kind of goes by the way, and you go back and uh, uh, get the CD player to play some music that you want to hear when you want to listen to music. It's been an interesting study. We've done, I've done lots of sermons about the origins of Christmas and the background and the dynamics of it. Uh, years ago, we had a regional television program in the, in the Northwest. And, uh, of course, we did that for 12 years. And we covered uh, the subject of Christmas every year, at least once. Sometimes we did two programs on it. But we watched the... Um, the eco economics of the Christmas season rise. For a long time, it has been the biggest uh, economic uh, holiday in, on the American calendar. And what was interesting was to see who was, what was second. And what has now risen to second, of all things, is Halloween. But uh, when you think about what you saw in the, in, the, uh, in the stores leading up to that, it makes perfect sense. But with Christmas, the spending starts with Black Friday. That's not a very nice way to start a season, dark and ominous, but appropriate, perhaps. We spend more, America does, on, on this particular day that's coming up than any other, any other similar activity at all. It's a huge-ass part of the retail spending. In a sense, it is what you might call deified spending. You know, we... Worship, America does. I would not include ourselves in that because we try not to do, get involved in that sort of thing. But unfortunately, our society has deified the economics of Christmas in addition to other things. But it has another, you know, there's the economic statement or economic angle, but there's another angle to look at uh, that this particular holiday, in, especially in the 21st century. It wasn't so much in the 20th century, but it is now. It is both a religious and a political statement, or a religious political statement. Maybe the two words, the two adjectives need to go together. On the one hand, it has, particularly for the conservative thinking Americans, it has become a way to make a statement about believing in God to the godless uh, atheistic liberals. So you have the conservatives versus the liberals in that. 
And it has become that, you know, the, the stand uh, against the removal of the uh, Ten Commandments on, on government property, and then they have their nativity scenes, and they try to get those removed, and so Christmas has become a religious political battle uh, in American politics and in American society. But since 2001, 9-11, it has also become a militant stand against Islam. The Christmas is considered by those who celebrate it to sort of be the quintessential Christian holiday, I guess. And so by decorating for it and talking about it and spending for it, you are uh, taking a stand against the terrorists that come out of militant Islam as well as taking a stand against the atheistic uh, liberals of society. Now, that wasn't so much the case by any means in uh, the, just a few years ago, before the 20th century had come to a close, but it certainly is now and seems to be gaining momentum from year to year. We don't observe Christmas as, as the Church of God, uh, but I think it's, it's a temptation. Number one, sometimes we think we, because we, we would be classified as conservative in our thinking uh, when you compare that to uh, in politics, but we're not involved in politics. We, we have a different politics. We have spiritual politics we're far more concerned about. And we actually support a king over a president. In fact, uh, he's a king over all the other kings and all the other presidents and all other heads of state from anywhere. And, of course, being Christ and anticipating his second coming. But we do, we do need to be cautious that Christmas does not become a temptation, not so much because of the commercialism. I think we see through that. But some want, are, are feel drawn or pulled to make a conservative statement. There are other ways to make similar statements than this. I think it's important for us to consider where Christmas came from so that we can understand why it is that we believe what we do and how we treat this particular holiday in America or anywhere else in the world. With Christmas past, here's the title for you, and it's sort of a specific purpose statement. I'll explain it all as we roll out. With Christmas past, you won't want Christmas present. I think it was, uh, that was the... Uh, Ebenezer Scrooge story. If I'm not mistaken, that was written by Dickens. Um, and that was actually, that story helped to make Christmas celebrations popular. You know, it wasn't popular for a time it was outlawed in, outlawed in England under Oliver Cromwell. The Puritans didn't believe in Christmas. They knew the same things about it we do. Um, but uh, that, and that carried over to New England and, and early America. Christmas was not a big deal. It was not until the mid-1800s that it began to gain momentum uh, as far as a holiday that was observed in the United States. And, and uh, Dickens' story helped to popularize it. Uh, then there was the Night Before Christmas uh, poem that was written in, the, I think, about 1860. That began to popularize it even more, so more people began to get involved in it. But it really didn't become a commercial event of any significance until late 1800s, around 1890. They invented Santa Claus. Uh, you think, well, hold on, well, I thought that was St. Nicholas. Well, yeah, it was based on that. But they invented Santa Claus and uh, began to then create all of the, the plastic myth about Christmas, that, le that layer of plastic myth about the particular holiday that's on our calendar. What we want to do is go back further than that past and go back to the past of the Roman Empire. You know, we can go into uh, Genesis 10, for example. We could read about Nim Nimrod, who was the first dictator after Noah's flood, uh, a world-ruling or attempted to be a world-ruling dictator. God made sure that that didn't happen. And he brought down his tower. But Nimrod, we read in secular history, because you can go back to the ancient histories of the mythologies of various, various uh, cultures, and certainly that was the culture because God scattered them with the Tower of Babel, scattered all the, the infants, infant nations every which direction. Our languages all had an in a point of origin, which, by the way, linguists have traced to that area of the world. 
and they scattered out from there. All the various families of languages which then separated into the national languages and even into dialects and so on. But the, the mythological stories of the Tower of Babel and of Nimrod in particular talk about his wife, whose name was Semiramis. She apparently was also his mother, and he was married to her. And then he was killed, uh, tradition says, by Shem, one of the sons of Noah, uh, put him to death. Uh, and then she, had, she was already pregnant and had a son, and she claimed was the resurrection of Nimrod, and his name was Tammuz. Or Tamas. Now that that's the very ancient aspect of it. So there have been celebrations in the pagan world down through time, from then on down to modern times, even that carried the a similar event or a similar holiday to Christmas. Well, I'm going to tell you the story, and with the end of the history story, or the history, we'll not call it a history lesson. I want you to stay awake. It's a story. It's a history story. Uh, and, and then we'll come to the scriptures nailing down why we don't want Christmas present. You know, when with Christmas past, or when you know Christmas past, you won't want Christmas present. We want to go to the Roman Empire. Because the question could be argued as far as Christmas goes, as a Christian holiday, you had to wait until there was a Christianity for that to become a Christian holiday. And that's exactly right. So we'll look at the timing of it. When did Christmas begin to be celebrated in Christianity? And I'm not talking about true Christianity because the true church of God never did celebrate it. But there was a, there was a beginning point. It varied in different parts of the greater Roman Empire. There were, there were beginning points, shall we say, as to when it was actually commemorated. And then we'll also look then at within mythologies uh, before, between the time of Nimrod and the time of the, the Roman Empire, look at the mythologies as, as to where Christmas was resurrected from. Normally we think it is a shorter version of Saturnalia, which was a um, pagan celebration right during this time of year. I think it started typically on the 17th of um, December and went for eight days, so it spilled over uh, into the 25th. And that was, you know, pagan celebrations were usually uh, very adulterous. That was part of the reason why you had the celebration. Lots of drinking, lots of carousing, and everybody, everybody doing it. Uh, and you could say, well, that would be the Romans. You know, they, they were Gentiles. They, they didn't have any Israelite sense. Well, the Celts were Israelites, and the Celts had equally awful celebrations around that time of year, even worse sometimes. So uh, it's important to, to see the balance in history. But let's go to the 200s. In the 200s, Christianity tried to calculate when Christ was born. That's when the discussion started going on. And when you can read this in Encyclopedia Britannica, the Catholic Encyclopedia, and a number of other uh, books that chronicle the ancient history. Uh, some thought he was born in May. Some thought he was born in March, the 25th of March. Um, later on, they decided, no, that's when he was conceived, so he could be born on the 25th of December. That was back in the day, and apparently this was a tradition uh, among those sorts of cultures that all the great men lived an exact number of years. And they, you know, died on the day they were born. And so they, that, that's why they came to that conclusion. And that's, that's not true, by the way, but that was the idealization of great men uh, or great leaders back in, in, ancient, in the ancient world. So in the 200s, they were the church leadership and the, and the Roman church began to discuss when Christ was born. There was no Christmas directly observed then. The Roman Saturnalia and its companion event called Brumalia, they sort of overlapped each other, and maybe they were called one in one area and another in the other, uh, were there. But it was, we want to focus on the middle to late uh, 200s. So here's the story. It's a story about the Emperor Aurelian. Uh, Rome as an empire had had a huge plague that swept through its ranks in about 250, which uh, 
killed enough people that it threatened their ability to field armies uh, as well as to keep their crops farmed. You know, because I don't know what the plague was caused by, but their plagues are normally recorded in ancient history, and, and there were a number of them. That was one in 250. One generation later, you have repopulated significantly from 250 to 270. Aurelian became the emperor. Aurelian is not usually talked about a great deal uh, in, you know, world history because he was only emperor for five years, just for five years, from 270 to 274, um, on September to September, basically. In, to, in that dear period of time, he had a great list of things to do. The economy was in a complete shambles. The economic system, which wasn't as systematic as ours, and was seemed to be just as much a house of cards as the modern economic system is, uh, had collapsed. And so the country was, you know, in, in part depression and part highway robbery phase at that time. The legions, now by the legions we mean segments of the army because they were organized into legions of soldiers. The legions were anarchic. In other words, they were taking the law into their own hands if they weren't being paid when they thought they should be and things like that. There, were, there had been two defections from the empire, one in the east, uh, which would be today um, eastern Turkey and Syria, that whole stretch right through there where all the, the ISIS stuff is going on right now. That had broken away and they called themselves the empire of Palmyra. Then at the other end of the empire, Britain and France, the Gallic end or the Celtic end of the empire, had broken away. And they, you know, had their proclaimed somebody to be their emperor or their leader. And so Aurelian had to deal with an empire that was breaking in pieces. And he had an econ economy that was in shambles. The... Uh, uh, morals of the country, and you think, well, what kind of morals when you have a Saturnalia you know, type celebration every year? Well, they had morals of Rome, the Roman sort that helped them to hold together, and mostly it was more of a martial uh, morality, uh, in other words, soldier based. That's why they were an empire. But they had, that was crumbling, and he had to find a way to restore that. On top of that, he had the Jutingi, Jutungi or Yutungi, depending on how you pronounce your J, which has to be the Jutes, who were invading Italy from the north and threatening them. And then there were two or three others. The uh, Alemanni was another group. Both of these, I believe, are of Israelite origin based on the names and ties in with other things. Then he had the Goths over in Pannonia, which we would know Pannonia as, uh, I think that's Hungary, and Dacia. So he had uh, them invading the empire. He had wars to fight all across the empire, from France all the way through Eastern Europe and clear over to where the um, French and the British forces are and the Turkish and the Russian forces. And now, interestingly, the German forces just opened a base. It's a tiny base. It has four, 40 men and two uh, surveillance planes that they fly, a plus their support crew. Uh, that are there now. The U.S. is only a little bit there. But right in there, they, you know, he had to deal with that massive Palmyran uh, breakup. So here's what happened. He, in five years' time, he defeated the Utingi and the Alemanni who kept invading Italy. Then he went up and he fought with the Goths that were pouring over the Danube down into uh, uh, Bulgaria and Romania area there, just south of the Danube. He fought with them, drove them back over the Danube, or he defeated them so badly that then they, they had to make a choice. They could become conscripts in the Roman army, which were called federates, or they could be sent someplace to run farms. Uh, but they, he broke their military might of one major Gothic invasion that was taking place. Uh, then he went across the Danube, fought with other Goths, and realized that he couldn't support Dacia. Dacia is what we would call Romania today, 
that part of it, north of the Danube. So he had all of the Roman citizens retreat back south of the Danube River, and he secured the border. The river was an easier border to keep secure than a line in the sand or the mud. So he got that taken care of. Uh, then he went and defeated the Palmyrans and came back. That seemed to be taken care of, and he dealt with the France and Britain situation, which was another war um, that uh, defeated that em wannabe emperor. And then Palmyra revolted again, so he went all the way back over there, and this time he thrashed them thoroughly and destroyed the city so that there would be no more question about it. In all this time, he was also trying to sort out the econ economics. He reorganized that in Rome itself and stabilized the empire tremendously. And you think, where does Christmas come in? Oh, oh, we're getting there. We're getting there. Bear in mind, he had to strengthen and recenter the moral, or as we would, as they might say, the spiritual center of the empire. Because it had lost, it lost its way of following the Roman ways. Uh, so he, had, he stabilized the army. He defended the borders, made them secure. He straightened out the financial system. And then he brought a new god back to Rome. Well, not completely new, but largely new. This god was called Mithras, M-I-T-H-R-A-S. Uh, if you want to spell it in Indian, it's M-I-T-R-A. That's shorter. Mitra. Mitra or Mithras. Also, it was, a, it was the same god was one of the gods of the Chinese. And in their case, it was a general, a mythical general that was Mithras. Bottom line, Mithras wasn't a new religion to the Romans, particularly the soldiers. The soldiers the rank and file of the Roman army, to a large extent, were Mithraic. They worshipped this god, who also happened to be called the sun god. So Mithras was the sun god. Uh, the sol invicte, meaning the unconquerable sun. Sol is sun, invicte is invincible. The invincible sun. In fact, the, the Romans, I've got an interesting comment here in one of the pieces that I had read. The soldier's god, even in Rome, although the faith was embraced by many emperors, farmers, bureaucrats, merchants, slaves, as well as soldiers, uh, Mithras demanded a high standard of behavior, temperance, self-control, that's pretty interesting for, you know, the, um, a, a pagan god, and compassion, even in victory. Thus, Tertullian, one of the other um, the early Christian leaders of the Roman church, uh, chides his fellow Christians for becoming an unbecoming behavior. And he said, Are you not ashamed, my fellow soldiers of Christ, that you will, not be, con will, you, that you will be rather condemned, not by Christ, but by some soldier of Mithras? You aren't behaving even as well as the soldiers who follow the sun god. So Mithras was uh, a significant concept. Aurelian strengthened the position of the sun god Sol Invictus as the main divinity in the Roman pantheon. That meant that there were many Roman gods, and we're aware of that. But he essentially brought in almost a monotheistic view by elevating Mithras to be the dominant of all the gods that the Romans worshipped. The concept, as historians look at the reign of Aurelius, is that he was following the principle of one faith, one empire. And it would be worshiping Mithras. And that his feeling was that Mithras uh, would be the primary deity, not that he would do away with all the other ones, but everybody can embrace Mithraism and not be offended. They could still worship their other gods, but in a minor way, including Christianity. That's what he intended for them to do as well. So this was Aurelian's solution. And actually, it worked pretty well within the pagan element of the Roman Empire. It didn't work so well for uh, Christianity, both traditional Christianity of this world and the true Christianity of God's church, uh, because he was willing to persecute them. Uh, but it stabilized the empire tremendously. It would have collapsed a lot sooner had it not been for Aurelius. He is called and was given a title, uh, several titles, because of all of his achievements in five years' time. Uh, one was uh, 
the uh, I forget what the title the the Latin is, but it was the stabilizer of the world, not just of Rome, but of the world. You know, they he brought the the Roman world back to its center with Mithraism. And you think, well, so what has that got to do with anything? Well, it, Mithraism is an interesting point. Let me read this little bit from the ancient classical history site. Mithraism arose in the Mediterranean world at the same time as Christianity. It was either imported from Iran um, or uh, from the Persians, essentially, at that time. That's where he got it. That's where Aurelian got it. Mithra was part of the Hindu pantheon I mentioned uh, as Mitra in India, and also a minor Zoroastrian deity, that would be in Persia, and a military general in mythology. The interesting item about Mithraism is its comparison to Christianity. It offered salvation to its adherents. Mithras was born into the world to save humanity from evil. Both figures ascended in human form, uh, referring to comparing Christ to Mithras, or Mithras. Mithras to wield the sun chariot Christ uh, to, to go to heaven, as the, uh, the article continues. Mithras, the sun god, was born of a virgin in a cave on December 25, aha, worshipped on a Sunday, at the day of the conquering sun. He was a savior god who rivaled Jesus in popularity. So what we have here is a clever deception. We had the sermonette about Satan and his attempts to deceive us. He certainly you tried to create counterfeit religions that were really close in certain ways to the true religion. Mithras then became the do dominant force in the religion of the Roman emperor, or the empire, and I was in the, by 275 when he was, Aurelian was, was dead and gone. His, the impact of his stability for the empire continued and ultimately for the Roman church because it was now 354. You go from 275 to 354, so um, 75, 80 years, and suddenly Christianity begins to observe Christmas on December 25. Plus they worship on Sunday and all the other parallels with Mithraism. Now there are elements and influence of other pagan, elements, pagan gods and goddesses and such, but Mithras seems to be one of the most dominant ones. Following Aurelian, he died in, in 275, uh, Tacitus became the emperor, and then ultimately Diocletian was the emperor about 300. You remember Diocletian because I believe it's the prophecy about Smyrna in Revelation chapter 2 that would have 10 days of, of trouble or persecution. Translating a day in prophecies, a year in fulfillment, it would be 10 years of persecution. And Diocletian instituted one of the most massive persecutions of Christianity that the Roman world had seen up to that time. It came to an end uh, when Constantine the Great became one of the contenders for the emperorship. And he fought against one of the successors that uh, followed Diocletian. He fought the civil war battle uh, at Milan, and he won. And he fought under the sign, as he thought it was, the sign of Christ, the Tau, painted on the shields of his, of his soldiers. And so then he defended Christianity. And within just a few years, Constantine established Christianity, that is, the world's Christianity, as the official uh, religion of the empire. That was... Uh, officially confirmed in 325 at the Council of Nicaea, when the doctrines of the Roman Church began to be systematized on a major way. And it, and it began to gain considerable momentum under Constantine. Constantine also was a Mithra follower. So he, he used some of the same tactics and had some of the same thinking as Aurelian did. By 354, it was the custom of the pagans, as they said in those days. Uh, this is the Syrian bishop, Jacob Bar Sabili, a 12th century writer. It was the custom of the pagans to celebrate on the same 25th December the birthday of the sun, which they kindled lights to in token of festivity. 
In these solemnities and revelries, the Christians also took part accordingly. When the doctors of the church perceived that the Christians had a leaning to this festival, they took counsel and resolved that the true nativity should be solemnized on that day. So they, and this is a, a pattern, by the way, denied when you look at the apologists who are trying to defend what happened, denied by them, but in fact, I, I think this, this was written by a 12th century bishop, in his assessment was when the Roman church leaders saw that people really liked the December 25 festival that had to do with Mithraism and Saturnalia rolled together, then they just adopted that day and put a Christian label on it. And that pretty much is how uh, an awful lot of the, the holidays on our, our, cal- our day-to-day calendar, how they originated. They didn't come from God's word or from God's way, and that's the important part that I think that we need to understand. Aurelian was a great man from the Romans' point of view, stabilizing the empire all that he did, but he sowed a seed that would be harvested about 80 years later and the beginning of the observation of a December 25th Christmas, celebrating the birth of Christ. Now, we know from the Bible he couldn't possibly have been born then based on the fact that John the Baptist was his cousin and he was six months older than Christ. And we know when John the Baptist, within two-week period, when he would have been conceived, because we know when John the Baptist's father, who was a priest of the, of the tribe of Levi, when his, his term to serve at the temple was. He was of the course or division of Abijah. King David had divided the... Uh, the, the priesthood into 24 divisions or courses, as they're sometimes called. And they would take their turn serving what, week one, week two, week three, all the way through week 24 at the beginning of the year. And then they would revert and do it again. During the annual holy days, they were all on duty. But you only needed one division on the, the day-to-day basis and the week-to-week basis. They changed their guard on the noon on the Sabbath. And... Uh, John the Baptist's father was of the course of Abijah, or Abiah, as the, depending on how you say the J. That was the eighth course. So he would have been in on the eighth week, and then you, we can do that sometime. But you run the math, and you find out that Christ, being six months younger than John, had to be born in the fall. In the beauty of the autumn, Christ was born across the sea. Not in the winter. And December 25 in the Northern Hemisphere is the winter, wherever you are in the Northern Hemisphere. So let's look then at what we, how we analyze this particular day once we see that uh, where the, the dates all came from. We have another way of looking. You know, when you understand Christmas past, you won't want Christmas present. Here are the main reasons, though, even more important than the history that we don't want it. Let's turn to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. Chapter 3. And we'll read uh, 14 to 16. Now, Paul is writing to Timothy. Timothy's... um, a younger minister, one of Paul's trainees in a sense, is <coughs> like a, a son in the faith to the apostle. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. And it's because of this verse in particular that the reference to the the house of God in the New Testament, when it isn't specifically talking about the temple, it's talking about the church, when you have that phrase, the house of God. The house of God, uh, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The pillar and ground of the truth. We learn our conduct, our way of living through the church of God, how to behave yourself or conduct yourself within the house of God, which is the church, the true church of God, the pillar and ground of the truth. God's true church keeps and teaches the true teachings that Jesus taught. 
and it rejects any false teachings that Jesus did not teach. So it seeks the truth. It does not seek untruth. Likewise, now we go to Christ's words himself in John, John chapter 4. John chapter 4. And you put these together and then you can see how we can say that the true church of God did not embrace Christmas. I might toss in another issue which would be interesting come next spring to visit more thoroughly. It's called the Quarto Deciman Controversy in church historical writings. Quarto Deciman. Quarto means, means 14 in Latin. Deciman, well, Quarto, four, 4 and 10. Quarto Deciman, or the 14th day, essentially is what it means. The 14th day of the first month, which is when the Passover is kept, on the 14th day of the first month. But the Roman church wanted people to keep Easter, not the Passover. And so long before Christmas was an issue, the, the issue of Easter came up, commemoration of Christ's death. And those who refused were called quartodecimans because they continued, persisted in keeping the Passover as they had been taught in God's true church. Those who embraced Easter and rejected the you know, quarto decimal of the 14th day of the first month of God's calendar uh, were then heavily persecuted. Uh, the reason I think why Christmas did not take root as quickly as far as the date goes in Asia Minor is because it was in Asia Minor that the quarto decimals were the strongest. The true church must have been strong there in the uh, 180s to 200s, early 200s uh, AD. So cry again, God's people seek God's truth, and Christ explains this. This is the discussion that he had with the Samaritan woman at the well up uh, in what was then a modern Samaria, not the ancient Samaria the Assyrians had destroyed, but it was built on the ruins of that same place. And the woman said to him in verse 19, she said, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet, and our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem... The mountain that she's referring to is Mount Ebal, which is right next to Samaria. Uh, she, but you Jews say that, you know, that uh, Jerusalem is where you should worship. And Jesus answered her and said, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, verse 22, you worship what you do not know. You worship in ignorance. And that, that was a polite way, as polite a way as you could say it, but it was direct as well. The Samaritans weren't the true, uh, the, the Jews. They had some Jewish DNA, but that doesn't make them the Jews that God was working through at the time. He says, you worship what you do not know. We, that is the Jews, know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. From Judah would come the Messiah, Christ himself. And Judah is where the name Jews comes from. It's the first syllable of the tribe's name. It included the bulk of the tribe of Judah, the Jews that was, they were known then, and a significant percentage, perhaps the majority of Benjamin, Paul was a Benjamite, and then a significant part of the tribe of Levi, the priesthood, primarily. But there were other support Levites that were also still among the Jews. The rest had been scattered and taken into captivity with the ten tribes. But Christ goes on to say in verse 23, But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Well, now, you, you, some could say, well, but it's the thought that counts. We know it's a pagan holiday, but it's for the children, you know? It's the spirit of the event. No, it's the spirit and truth. They have to go together. You can't have one or the other. It is not... Uh, worshiping God in the spirit and untruth. It is an untruth to think that Christ was born on December 25 and that the modern 
sacrifice that has come down to us Christmas is a day that God wants us to observe. He doesn't. Not by any means. The test is, did Jesus teach it? He did teach to observe certain days. Passover, the days of unleavened bread. Pentecost, a feast of trumpets. Feast of tabernacles and the last great day. He did teach those. But he did not teach this to be kept, or Easter to be kept. So these days, this particular day in December is not a true day or not a true festival of God. It is an untruth in that sense. Let's look to Luke 6, because not all the Jews were by any means faithfully following God. Luke chapter 6, because Christ here takes them to task. You know, they recognized him as a teacher, but that was about it. Verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? Meaning master, master. In other words, the one who can tell you how things should be done or how, what you should do. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you do not do the things that I say? And then he goes on with the parable, whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I'll show you whom he is like. He's like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid foundations on a rock. And the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently against the house, but it couldn't shake it because it was built on a rock, founded on a rock. But the other guy, he just builds it on the sand and the sand erodes away and down comes his house. He was like the first little pig. Even though he used bricks, it still didn't work. So here we have Christ then uh, challenging those who would do what they want to do. Why do you not do the things which I say? Did Jesus say to keep Christmas? No, he did not. Which did he say? Well, he gave us the Sabbath. He gave us the annual holy days of the Bible. Keeping those festivals, are, are those are the festivals that God commands his people to keep. Now, the world doesn't understand that. Their eyes aren't open to that. But we need to understand why we do what we do. Their day will come, and we'll have the opportunity to open their eyes to it. Let's, let's go back and add to this in Jude. I won't tell you which chapter, but when we get there, we'll find it. Okay. Jude. Jude 3. Starting in verse 1, Jude, a bond servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. The James being referred to here is James, who wrote the book of James, which was James, the brother of Christ. So that makes Jude a brother of, brother of Christ. Therefore, he's a brother to Christ as well. Half-brother, technically, because their mother was the same. But obviously, James and uh, Jude were born of Joseph, not of God the Father, or through the Holy Spirit. To those who were called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. Now, there's a, uh, that part of the verse is one that we haven't mined for some time, but quite a fascinating. Sanctified, called, and then sanctified by the Father and preserved in Christ. Mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. And then he begins. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation... I have found it necessary to write to you, to ex exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. The faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Did Christ teach Christmas or Easter observance? No, he did not. He had other days that he taught, but not those days. Well... Some could say, well, yes, well, he taught that then because the people expected it. But later, he changed it. Now, let's go back and read this again. Earnest, you should contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. The faith isn't going to change. It was delivered then, and that's what is delivered to the saints now. It doesn't change. No matter how much, you know, somebody might want it changed, but it doesn't change. It is a common salvation. It's no new salvation with some other salvation to be offered later. Earnestly condemned once for all, the, the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. They did not deliver a different faith centuries later. In, three, in the 350s, there was not a new faith being delivered. 
It was the true faith that Christ himself had delivered, which is what God's people operate on. So how did we get the other one? How did this day come in? How did all of the, the various Christian religions get their start? Well, that's in verse 4. For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny our Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. There are those who crept in, and then they took the truth of God, and they changed it every which direction to make it into a religion that they could champ be the champions of rather than Christ himself being the champion of. And they went on then. Uh, I want to get that last line of this one. Ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny, notice that they adopted, in the Roman times, they adopted the Christmas because they saw that you know, traditional Christians liked it. And so there's a lewdness that went with it because it was part of Saturnalia, boom, boomalia. And so they liked that. So they adopted it, and they had to carry over some of the behaviors, certainly with the Celts they did later as well. They had... They, the, um, let me see, to turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. How can you deny the Father and Christ? Well, one can deny God by teaching doc doctrines that he didn't teach. And he taught through Christ. Christ was the word. One can also deny Christ and or the Father by teaching against the doctrines that Jesus did teach. So you can either... Uh, deny the teachings that Christ taught or deny, or deny by teaching doctrines that are different from what Christ taught. And, of course, that brings us to the controversy of the, God's holy days of the Bible versus the, the holidays with pagan roots uh, of, of Christianity or any other religion for that matter. Further, let's go back to Ephesians chapter 2 for no, one more anchor scripture in this particular regard. Ephesians chapter 2. It's right near the end of the chapter. Verse 19, we begin. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So when we go to analyze what we observe and what we don't observe, what is a temptation for us or what is not, uh, we see what Christ and the apostles taught. Christ laid down the law, what the true faith was. The apostles spread that knowledge and where he added detail, it was all stay, still the same fundamental teaching, but if it was any detail to be added or additional elements to be uh, inspired, for instance, on the day of Pentecost, and the fulfillment of that, they began to get the inkling of what, they were, what their job was to be. Well, then Christ did that through the, the apostles, and then through their writings, as well as through the writings of the prophets. That's how he unfolded his truth, was through the prophets and the apostles. And Christ being the chief cornerstone. Again, God's truth, the true way um, of life, is built on Christ's teaching and on his example. So the get back to our, our title, you know, that we, we have with Christmas past, or when you get to, when you understand Christmas past, you won't want Christmas present. Christmas past didn't have anything to do with Christ. It had no, it had no uh, genetics, so to speak, uh, as far as... Now, philosophy or teaching went. It had no genetics that came from Christ. It had no teaching that came from Christ. It was a day that was manufactured from a pagan holiday from several different origins and, and, and then the synthesis of several different uh, pagan holidays. But it had nothing particularly at all to do with the Bible. I think it's important just for us to understand these things and realize why it is and why we can be thankful, brethren, that God has opened our eyes to know what his truth really is.